Well, it's my pleasure to introduce Jake, and I'm going to make this really informal, if that's okay, Jake. Um, I think I remember J my first memories of Jake was as like a 19-year-old, snotty-nosed kid, sort of, uh, just a young freshman who had the audacity to apply for the India program. And uh, I probably never told you this, but we're like, Jesus, is he old enough? Can we send somebody so young? And then uh, he just ends up being this stellar uh, example in that uh, uh, he went, uh, partially because of his amazing endurance, you went with seven or eight women, is that right? Mm -hmm. Seven women, he was the only guy uh, uh, three, four months in India and uh, they, the best thing about it is they all loved him, you know, I, and uh, it, it was really a great experience. Jake then uh, ended up serving a mission in Russia, and as soon as he came back, I knew his caliber was good enough that we got him as a field facilitator to work in the office, and you worked for three years as India field facilitator. And, uh, and then just kind of one more, well, I have to say the most important thing is he married a wonderful woman named Michelle, and he's an expecting father here, so um, you'll want to congratulate him on that. Um, but last, no, two years ago, almost two years ago, I show up in the village, uh, Chavati village, which Jake will probably mention some things about. I come dragging in, sort of, but here comes Jake out on the veranda. He looked like death eating a cracker. I don't think I ever told you that. He looked really sick. And then the whole group had been been down with something. And But, you know, um, so I've seen him in the field, and uh, Jake is a wonderful, responsible person. When he left BYU, I immediately got my wife to hire him. Uh, actually, um, she is... She really, really has appreciated Jake and his uh, abilities down working in uh, with blood services down here. And he, he was pre-med and has done an excellent, excellent job in preparing for medical school. And I um, hope I don't embarrass you, but he's been accepted into some really fine, fine uh, medical schools. And I think that that might be helpful for some of you here, because I know a few of you are, are pre-med students. And um, I think it will be uh, valuable to hear his insights on the journey that he took. And that's so with that really informal introduction, I'll turn the time over to you, Jake. I think uh, on that first trip, the only reason those girls ended up liking me is because I remembered on Valentine's Day, I went to the nicest store there in Coimbatore, bought them all chocolates and brought her back and gave them to him. And ever since then, they, they loved me. So that was, that was the only thing. But we were actually together for five months, just over five months, that first trip. <clears throat> so that was back in uh, 1999. And I hope you guys don't mind. I'm just going to talk a little bit about not so much what I studied, but more about my experience uh, in India, my experience with field studies and what it's done for me as a student, as an individual. Um, so that first trip to India, like Dave said, I was a freshman. I was actually 18 and about three weeks old. And, uh, <clears throat> and I applied. I actually have a uh, family. Uh, my grandmother's grandmother was from India. So I'd grown up with a few stories about India and always had dreamed about going to India. And when I learned that there was an India program at BYU, uh, I went up and applied immediately and was told no <clears throat> initially. And then later when they found out they had the seven girls and they needed a guy, they, uh, they came back and asked me to go. So that was nice. Um, but it wasn't until after I got back from my first trip that I realized how much or how important field studies were. Um, on my very first trip, things were quite a bit different then. There was um, less structure to the program than there is now. Um, I actually didn't have any academic direction at the time. I just kind of studied whatever I wanted. And... Uh, <clears throat> And the preparation was a lot shorter. It was a lot more. We, we crunched it into just a few weeks, really long nights, really long days of meeting together for 12 hours and talking about India. But uh, I, I didn't feel, I felt much more prepared the second time than I did the first time, which I was really grateful for. But when I returned from my mission and got back into classes, I realized that <clears throat> I enjoy the traditional lecture system, you know, where you go to class, 
Teachers write things up on the board, you take notes, you ask questions, you read the books, you take tests, do quizzes, and then you get your grades. Um, and they're based on how you do memorizing facts or how well you can apply information in essays. And it was during my first semester back that I realized that field studies and the way field studies are set up is just an awesome, awesome opportunity for undergraduate students. Um, for me in particular because it, allows me to, it allowed me to study whatever I wanted to kind of set my own guidelines and criteria for being graded and then also uh, and it, it left all the preparation up to me. So it was, uh, it was a lot more my own education than, than the traditional classroom, classroom setup and I, I really enjoyed that. And I found that I really uh, learned a lot more that way. Like I retained information better. I also it just enjoyed learning. Uh, I, uh, I studied, the first time I went, my studies were very, very generic. Uh, it was mostly just, I was mostly just there to get ethnographic experience. So I spent uh, two and a half months in a village in Chavati, like Dave said. And all my time was spent just kicking it with the villagers. You know, I just just hung out with the guys, went to where they worked in the fields, otherwise stayed home with the kids and played games or uh, watched Tamil soaps, you know, um, just, just did kind of what the villagers did, just took notes on it, you know. And uh, my second time, I studied the Panchayat Raj. And the reason that I decided to study the Panchayat was because uh, I was interested in development and I was interested in political science. Um, I, I decided to major, my major was International Studies, the old International Studies major. And the reason that I picked it was because I loved the resources that anthropology provided and I liked studying political systems. So I kind of, my, my degree was largely political science and anthropology and, and I loved it and that worked out stellar for me, it was great. And my first time in India, just kind of towards the end, through my observations, I realized that the panchayat was where it's at, you know, in India, as far as development's concerned. It's, it's grassroots, you know, it's uh, what the panchayat is, is it's, uh, it's like the city government or village government. And people are elected to serve for five years. And traditionally, the panchayat was all male. <clears throat> uh, the British, when they came into India, they uh, gave some additional powers to the panchayat to collect taxes and, and other things, which didn't work out very well. And so the panchayat was kind of this old institution where they would resolve kind of interpersonal or interfamilial or intervillage conflicts. There were a group of elders that would sit down with people and try and resolve conflict. And uh, in 1992, they passed these two amendments, the 73rd and 74th Amendment, which not only gave the panchayat a lot more responsibility and funding from the, the national level, but it also implemented these two reservations or two quotas, one for women and one for untouchables, which previously was unheard of. You know, and uh, and it, it wasn't passed, for, it wasn't uh, implemented for two years throughout the nation, so 1994 it was implemented. And there were about five or six states that, that completely retarded the implementation of these amendments. In fact, they passed legislation to oppose these national constitutional amendments. Um, and Tamil Nadu was one of them. It was one of the states that we studied in. So <clears throat> the Supreme Court, five years later, struck down the state legislation and actually said, I, I love this about India because they could do this. I don't know if they could do this in the U.S., but the Supreme Court said, okay, if you guys don't pass uh, appropriate legislation and, and enforce it within the next year, you're all going to lose your jobs as state officials. That's it. I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no, uh, no discussion about this. That's, that's, that's the deal. And so, of course, they implemented these changes uh, where they held uh, immediate elections. Women ran. Uh, untouchables ran. And they were actually voted on to the panchayat. Now, the reservation is that one-third of all the seats have to be filled by women. And for untouchables, depending on the proportion of untouchables in the village area. So if one-tenth of the population is untouchable, then one-tenth of all the seats need to be held by untouchables. And this caused a lot of problems initially. I mean, there were some, well, they were sporadic, but they were, there were a few really violent uprisings because India, traditionally, this is something that just doesn't work. 
Uh, you don't have women or untouchable men, or untouchable women for that matter, making decisions in how the village is going to develop. You know, what projects in the village get funding? What areas in the village get funding? Um, and and it, was, it was interesting. You know, most of the stuff that I found when I was preparing suggested that this was not going to work. This was going to, you know, something was going to give. And something was going to give soon, and it was going to be reverting back to the way things were. Men holding the power and, you know, largely non-untouchables, the upper caste, sitting on the panchayat. So, um, so I decided to study the panchayat. I thought, well, this is really interesting to me. This is grassroots. This is development. And this is also political systems. You know, this is a way people organize themselves. This is a way that people pr find uh, ways to make change. And, uh, and it was something that I wanted to study. So my second time going back to India, um, that's, that's what I decided to study. And I worked as the facilitator, the office facilitator. And I think I spent most of my efforts actually trying to help the other students get ready. I don't know how good a job I did, Andrew, but, but uh, he's giving me a thumbs up, so that's good. Um, I spent, I, I, I recognize now that I neglected my own research, uh, and I really should have done more. But e even so, you know, I did spend time in the library researching uh, different topics on the panchayat. And it wasn't until, you know, I'd probably spent maybe 20 hours going over abstracts, going over different articles and books, that I finally found something that really interested me about the panchayat. And it was a an art article by this uh, Swedish author, his name was Eric something, I can't remember his last name, but um, which talked about this discrepancy and how, how um, most of the women were just puppets for their husbands. Most of the untouchables were, were, they were provided with the funds to run for election by different political organizations or by upper caste members. And so they were essentially puppets also. And I thought, well, that's really interesting because I don't know that I necessarily saw that, but you know, I want to see if that's really true. And it was about tw after 20 hours of just kind of scanning through documents that I found that. And I think I was really lucky because most of the students that I worked with, I mean, to spend 20 hours and find something really good is, is pretty, uh, pretty amazing. You know, most of the students spent 40, 60, maybe 100 hours in the library looking for uh, different documents and stuff. So I was really excited to find that after about 20 hours. And then that provided me with the direction I wanted to go in in my research. Um, Let's see. For most of my, so my, my hypotheses was along the lines of, in India, due to the amendment changes, things are not, uh, let's see, I can't remember what my hypothesis was. Well, roughly it was that things weren't working and that most of the data suggested, that I could find anyway, that something would, some kind of social, cha social change would happen soon that would effectively remove the uh, reservations for women and untouchables. And uh, so I wanted to see if that was actually what, what was happening. Is this true? That was, you know, my hypothesis, or the question that I was asking and trying to find information on. And uh, the means of gathering information for me largely rested in interviews. So I was really happy to have taken the, the prep course by Dave. Uh, I'd been in it two or three times, going through how to conduct interviews and, and how interviews can be fun and yet very trying. Uh, in an international setting. And I, I wanted to go through just three different examples of, of the types of interviews that I had, which were always just amazing and a thrill and kind of frustrating. But uh, one of the interviews was with uh, a man from the village where we stayed in Chavati. Uh, he, his, uh, he had translated for students previously, so he had previous translating experience. Spoke English very well. Spoke Tamil. It was his, na uh, his native tongue. And we went out to a neighboring village from where he lived. We met with, uh, we drove out to the panchayat building, sat down, and we, we talked with the secretary of the panchayat, someone who's, the secretaries are appointed by the state. So it's not a village office, it's a state office. And uh, they do that to help kind of curtail corruption. And so we, we talked to the secretary for a while, and eventually this guy drove up on a motorcycle and walked out in this really, really nice outfit, you know, a white, Dhoti with like gold around the bottom and gold running down the side, which a dhoti is like this white, nice, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, it's almost like a skirt. It's a tube skirt that they wear, a wrap that they wear. But um, dhotis are like for more formal occasions usually. So this guy's wearing a nice dhoti, he's wearing a nice shirt, walks in, you know, he's got a nice mustache, and very nice hair, 
uh, beautiful teeth, you know, nice tan, kind of an older gentleman, walks in, everyone stands up, you know, he comes and he sits down at the head of the table, and I ask Matthew who this is, and they talk for a minute, and he says, well, this is the Panchayat president, this is the president of the Panchayat. I'm like, oh, cool, like, I have a lot of questions I want to ask him. And so, uh, so I, I'd ask a question like, well, how long has he been serving? What does he think of the reservations? You know, how many women are on the Panchayat? Are they good workers? Are they carrying the same workload as the men? Do you think that people will, uh, you know, is it acceptable? Is it working? And I'd ask, you know, I'd ask one question. The interview took up about three to four hours of talking with this gentleman and, and a few other individuals that came in. And uh, I'd ask one question like, well, how long have you been serving? And my translator would ask him and they'd talk. And there'd be a response from my translator and then we would talk and then someone else would talk. And then Matthew, or my translator, would look back at me and say, four years. And I mean, anyone who's had any kind of international translating experience knows that this, this just happens sometimes, where they just kind of go off for a while and then they give you a very brief response. Well, that's how the first two hours of my interview went. Uh, I'd ask a question, and they'd talk for about 10 minutes, and I'd just sit and nod and smile and like, kind of jot down like, I, I'd jot down as much as I could as far as you know, nonverbal language, but there just wasn't much. I didn't know very, many, very much Tom at the time, and, uh, and I'd get really, really brief responses for the first two hours or so. But it wasn't until later that I realized, that I learned, that this gentleman actually was not a member of the Panchayat. His wife was the president of the Panchayat. Uh, but he carried about half the responsibility, if, if maybe even more, where he would come to the Panchayat, he would sign all the paperwork, he would sign all the checks, uh, he would have meetings with Panchayat members, and then the other half of the time his wife would do it, which was... I thought really interesting. Um, He also had served, you know, to his credit, he'd served as Panchayat president, as the actual president, uh, two terms. So, but this was like 20 years back. Anyway, it was it was a great, it was a very informative interview. It was kind of a frustrating interview, but it was a lot of fun. The second type of interview I had was uh, I had the privilege of working with an NGO out in India that um, received government funding to teach. Uh, courses for Panchayat members, for new Panchayat members, to help them realize, or I guess, yeah, realize is probably a good word, that having women on the village council is okay. Having untouchables on the village council is okay. And there is funding that you can get, and we'll show you how to get it. So th- they provided these types of courses for Panchayat members. And I, and I worked with this institution. And they um, were nice enough to provide me with a translator for about probably half of my, my interviews, if not more, which was great. I mean, they were, it was something that they did. I, I interned for them, and then they provided me with a translator for a lot of my interviews. And the translator that, that worked with me, um, you know, he had a good understanding of what my research was. He himself had a master's degree in sociology. I think he also had an additional master's degree in urban planning or some kind of urban development. And... Um, and he would accompany me on these these interviews. And it was interesting. I had one very, uh, one example that sticks out to me very clearly was right towards the end of my project, uh, we went out to interview this lady who had taken funds. She had applied for some money from the Panchayat, which is what the Panchayat does. People can apply for small projects for small loans, and the Panchayat can issue that. Um, And then they they repay. And this lady had... uh, applied for a small loan for a, a, a telephone booth, a, pay, a payphone booth that she had, where you could pay for either state calls, local calls, or actually international calls. And, um, and she was a Panchayat member, and her friend who helped her run it was also a Panchayat member, and they'd been on for about four years. So they're fairly experienced Panchayat members. And we talked for a while. We had a very good interview. And uh, towards the very end of the interview, you know, I asked... I asked uh, my translator to ask them if, if they felt like they were treated equally, if they felt like they were treated the same by Panchayat president, by Panchayat members, and by villagers, other villagers, as the, the men members, the male members. And, um, and so he, he asked the question. You know, by this time, my Tom had picked up a little bit. So you, you get a gist of what they're saying, make sure they're asking the right question. And, uh, and he did. And she, she responded, you know, very quickly and very loudly, no, like, no, we're not treated the same. And I'm like, oh, great, like, I have some follow-up questions for you. And my translator's like, when he heard this, like, I perk up, and, he's, and he perked up too, but in a very different way. He's like, what do you mean no? 
It's like, of course, of course you're treated the same. You know, and, and she's like, no, no, we're not. And so they went off for a minute and talked, and I didn't quite catch the rest of it because they're speaking so fast, you know, having this nice little discussion, kind of almost a heated discussion about whether or not they were treated equally. And, you know, I can see that she's flustered. I can see that my translator's flustered. And, and then, you know, about 10 minutes later, he stops, looks at me, and he goes, yes, they're treated exactly the same. <laughs> and I'm like, all right. I just missed out on this whole discourse. Like, but, you know, whatever, all right. So I moved on to other questions. So it was interesting to work with this individual who knew what my project was about, but also having come from this institution who was kind of striving for equality, striving to show people that they're doing a good job of making the men and the women equal and the untouchables and the men equal, had kind of morphed the answers uh, for me, which was, which was interesting. Uh, and I'm sure you'll all run into this too. I'm, I'm just giving you this as kind of a heads up, all right? So you can be prepared. Uh, the last interview, which was uh, the last type of interview, was actually the best interview, uh, was with another individual from that same institution, but who had just about no knowledge, no understanding of what my project was. So he had no idea what I was going for, what I was getting at. And we actually just had a very casual relationship. We didn't know each other very well. And uh, he sat in because my normal translator had to go to a meeting. And, um, and it was great because I'd ask questions and he would very directly translate them. And I was interviewing these two ladies. And, uh, and they would respond back. And, and I could see the surprise in his face. He'd be like, really? Like, you feel this way from the women? And he'd be like, Jacob, like, they feel this way. Like, this is how they feel. He's like, I can't believe I'm hearing this. And I'd be like, this is great. All right, you know, keep asking questions. And, and he, he provided a very, a, a very unbiased interview. He was a great translator. And that was probably the best interview I got out of, you know, out of all 30 or whatever I did, or 40, uh, that was probably the best interview I got because he didn't, he didn't know what I was going for, and so he just translated as directly as he could, and it was, it was really great. But I found from this that I'm, I'm uh, a little more skeptical of international research that's done, uh, that's social science research, that's, that's based on surveys, that's based on interviews, uh, because there's a lot of things that can complicate interviews, and unless you're actually the one doing the interview yourself in a, a language that you're entirely familiar with, then there's going to be some kind of complications. And they're really hard to account for in your research, which you know, I found that was really hard to account for in my research. However, I did find that in the area of Tamil Nadu where I stayed, where eight years prior they had had all sorts of problems accepting women and untouchables, that the general feeling, aside from that first panchayat that I mentioned, the general feeling of the panchayats that I'd interviewed, the panchayat members, as well as the villagers, as well as Panchayat presidents that I'd interviewed, most people felt that things were going actually surprisingly well, that things were going in a very good direction, that they could see at some point, maybe like 50 years down the road, that it would be 50% women and 50% men. You know, that uh, they had no problems letting women do, do work, even though women, most of the women, if not all the women on the Panchayat, still had tremendous household responsibilities in addition to what they were doing at the Panchayat. So they were usually given a slightly smaller workload, but they were every bit as efficient as the men. And in many cases, the Panchayat presidents would applaud the women more, than, more so than the men. They were getting more done. They were more interested about their constituents, um, which was really interesting. Same with the untouchables. The, uh, many of the, let's see, not the Panchayat presidents, but many of the upper caste members in the villages that I interviewed where the Panchayat was working felt that that this was a good thing, primarily because the untouchables or the uh, kind of worse off sections of the village were actually getting projects done. They were having water, like running water put in. They were having um, to uh, sewage put in. They were having projects that were taking place primarily in the underdeveloped areas of the village because they had representation in the, go in the village government. So the upper caste men who lived in usually nicer areas, usually much nicer houses with plumbing and water already, were like, you know, this is great, you know. They, they, they need it, they deserve it, this is good, this is a good thing. This, this decentralization, this grassroots development, this is a good thing. I'm okay with that because it only affects me as slightly and they're happier and I'm happier because a lot of them work for me, so it's okay. You know, th that sort of mentality. So it, it was really good. So my findings were largely that, that this was a good thing, that people were not trying to 
take away the reservations. In fact, they were supporting it. People were having really good elections. The elections were all democratic. They're held every five years, and lots of people run. And most of the people are not supported by local political organizations like I thought previously. They're, they're actually at the village level, for the village panchayat, you are not allowed to have any kind of political backing or affiliation when you run. When you run, you run as your, your own individual, your own name. There's no party symbol. There's no, uh, there's no funding that comes to you from a party. Um, and so that's what, that's what my findings were, which I was really excited to find because that's not what I they had expected to find. I had actually had expected to find that things were exactly as the, the data I had reviewed before going to India uh, was true, that people were really upset about this and that they were going to make some changes and start burning people or you know do something, do something drastic to get things changed back to the way it was. All right, so... You know, I'm, I'm now going to talk about more the effects of the, the research, more the effects of the field study on schooling, on life, and that sort of thing. Um, when I returned home, even actually from the first time going to India, but particularly more with the second time, you know, I, I initially was interested in development and doing developmental, developmental anthropology, being some kind of a cultural broker for NGOs and governments or small communities. Same kind of thing as, as the Panchai. This was what, you know, really interested me. And, hey, Matt. And um, what I found was, you know, it, this just wasn't for me. The development arena was not for me. Uh, I, I like it. I support it. It's an interest for me, but it's not something that I felt like I could do as a career. And I decided to change, actually fairly late as a senior, to do pre-med. Um, what I found, though, is that after this field study mentality where the project that I had decided to do, you know, the preparation that I had decided to do had paid off for me. You know, it was something that it was something that I was interested in, something that I studied, and something that I feel like I benefited greatly from my research. I don't know that it really will affect the grand scheme of things or will affect the panchayats or millions of people in India, but for me as an individual it was it was amazing. For me as a student it was even more amazing because I found that as I started taking classes like the chemistry classes, which are kind of mundane and kind of boring and a lot of memorization, the physics classes, the physiology classes, the biology classes, instead of just sitting, you know, memorizing what we're going to be doing in class, reading the chapters, doing the quizzes and the papers, I took a, a very different approach to it. And, and uh, I think Dave probably saw this. Instead of it being, I just want to get through the class and I just want to get an A, I did a lot of it on retention. It was okay, I'm in this chemistry class, what do I want to get from this? You know, what's the point of me putting in preparation if I'm not going to get anything from it? So I started studying more from the, the viewpoint of, I, I, I'm taking this class because I want to, and now I'm going to prepare like I'm preparing for research or I'm preparing for a field study in a way that suits me and in a way that, I'm, that I can enjoy. And I actually did, I did very well in those classes academically. Um, and I think it's just because my mentality changed entirely from classes. I think when we get to college from high school, I work with a lot of high schoolers. I get to see a lot of high schoolers who do high school blood drives. And the seniors are always very excited about going to college. You know, I'm going to go to college. What are you going to study? I don't know, but I'm going to enjoy it. I'm like, okay, that's cool. And then being in, in college, you know, two or three years, it's like there's this mentality that I just need to get through college. You know, I don't, I don't really care if I enjoy it. I just need to get through it because I really can't do much with an undergraduate degree and chances are I'm not going to work in the field I study anyway. So I'm just going to get through it, get my degree, and move on to something else. It was fun to see this, this, this backwards translation to, you know what, I, I'm enjoying college. Like, I'm taking the classes because I, I want to be here. Uh, I, I, I forgot that that's why I came to college, was to enjoy it and to learn something, you know, and have a good time doing it. And, and, it, and it radically changed my, uh, my academic attitude. It was... It was, it, my wife, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, I, I really enjoy classes after that. Um, also, like I said earlier, I'm much more skeptical of, of research, not just, not just social science research, but primarily social science research. Um, also, I mean, even the hard sciences, I want to read up on medical research that's gone on. That's gone on you know, I, I always read the ramifications, what, what the actual study was what the results were, and then how they translated those results into their conclusion, because sometimes they don't agree with their conclusion, or sometimes they just totally fudge numbers, you know. Um, so I became much more, much more skeptical of, of research. But I appreciate good research a lot more, because I know it's really hard to do. Um, also, uh, this last trip to India, 
so I've been married for going on three years now. And this last trip to India, which was a, just over four months, uh, I spent the first two months in India with the students. The third month, my wife came over. And then the, she left at the end of the third month. So the fourth month, I was by myself again. And actually, it was just a little bit longer than that. And India is an amazingly diverse place. It's a, it's a very interesting place. It seems like a place that everyone can find something they like about it. But at the same time, India is a very difficult place to live. It kind of kicks your butt. Uh, at some point, it will kick your butt. It's just That's just the way it is. India is just like that. But um, I found that as a married individual, it was, it was an amazing experience. Uh, and I'm sure that those of you who are married that have been on field studies with your spouse can attest that, that it's a very uh, awesome experience to go with your spouse. It puts you in very different circumstances. Here in Utah or wherever we are, we kind of flow in this, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, we're just this tide of comfort, right? We don't, we don't really do things that we're uncomfortable with. But out in India, you're uncomfortable with like 90% of the stuff you do. So being there with your spouse, it puts you in these really interesting situations where your spouse gets to see the best of you and gets to see the worst of you, like when you maybe start to attack a, a poor Indian man asking for money because you feel like he ripped you off and you're not going to give him any money, you know, stuff like that. So um, but it was a very good experience for, for strengthening our marriage relationship. Uh, it also provided a lot of fun experiences that we reflect back on and think, and think you know, this was really fun about India. And sometimes we'll say, man, I'm really glad I'm not in India right now. Or like, do you remember this about India? Like, I hated that. Or this, I love this. And so my wife, being sick probably two-thirds of the time she was there, had a, a much more difficult time, I think, really enjoying and, and actually even experiencing India because she spent so much time kind of just under the weather. So in either in our hotel room or uh, traveling around in, in cars, she didn't get to see a lot of it. But she's... When she came home, she got very sick, was not interested in ever going back to India. But now, a year and a half later, we've decided that we're, we're going to go back eventually once we get the money. I don't know. If any of you guys want to pay for us to go, we'll go. But, uh, but for any of you who are considering marriage and field studies, they work out great. Let me just tell you. I mean, maybe a little more expensive, but, but the benefits greatly outweigh the, uh, the cost. Um, and then lastly, I just want to talk a little bit about kind of advice or regrets that I had uh, as far as field studies are concerned. Um, like I mentioned earlier with my second trip to India, I felt like, I didn't feel like this at the time, but afterwards I felt like I neglected my own research uh, to a degree because I was trying to help other students prepare. And I wish I'd spent more time preparing for my research uh, the second time. Because really, you know, field studies are great. If you prepare well, it's great. You can pat yourself on the back. If you don't prepare well, it's your own fault. And so, you know, who's to blame? You. And so I felt like I was prepared culturally, but research-wise, I really wish I would have spent just, just more time reading, more time looking up stuff, because I felt like there's a lot of information that I, that I missed. And then I found when I got home, actually, when I got home from my research, or from India, spent a couple of days or a couple of weeks just looking up random topics about the panchayat that I wanted to know, that I hadn't been able to, to gather while I was there. And it was there, I just had to look for it. So my advice to those of you who are preparing for field studies is just prepare like mad. Just, you know, it's all up to you. It's all your research. But still, at the same time, y y there's so much information out there that you, can, that you can lean on and still get new information for yourself. It's just important to go out there and find it. And you really have to look to find it. Um, the second thing is is about journals. And for those of you who are in the, the preparation course or will soon be in the preparation course, I'm sure you'll hear m multiple times how important it is that you, after experiencing something, record it in your journal. And I believe part of the curriculum, if it hasn't changed, is to write a daily journal, you know, to show, to show that you're insightful, right? That's the goal is to, it doesn't matter how long it is, you just need to be insightful. Well, I found, I found myself falling into, when I got to India, uh, I would write, okay, here are the day's events, you know, a chronological explanation of what happened that day with very little insight into the actual events. I would just describe them as unbiased as I could, just be like, okay, well, I was hit in the face with a cow pie today. And, you know, 
and that would be the end of it. There'd be no insightful remark after that, you know, not that there could be, but, um, but I found that going back and looking on my journal afterwards when I was preparing for my final research write-up, that there were experiences that I remember having that I didn't write very much about in my journal. So I really wish I would have kept a better journal because there's just, there's so much that goes on. And I wish I would have spent more time writing in my journal and possibly less time playing cards or, I don't know, doing, doing something. But uh, so for those of you who are preparing, I just I recommend really, really just hunkering down when you're in field and you know, concentrating on your journal. Because your journal is your, that's your life source when you get back. That's, that's your research when you get back. And if you do a poor job writing down your journal, your research is going to be poor. And the third thing is, the, the, the third and last thing is simply that uh, when I, for medical schools, you go out and you do interviews. For, um, for graduate schools, I believe you go out and do interviews sometimes, depending on what you're, what you're studying. And I found that my experiences interviewing in India made my interviews for medical school like cake. It was nothing, you know, just because there wasn't the stress of trying to, of thinking, man, like, I hope that he's translating this correctly, or I hope he got that question right, or I hope that I'm not going to get, you know, kicked out of this building, or it, it was all, it was, it, most of my interviews, I think, I don't know that they went really well, but I know that I felt really, really good about them. I was really at ease because I'd had, I mean, I'd done, like, you know, 40 or 50 interviews in India, and it, it was no problem. So that, that was one great benefit. So for those of you who are considering furthering your, furthering your education, you know, take advantage of the experiences you have on your field studies because they'll help prepare you for future experiences, uh, for future opportunities, for future interviews and that sort of thing. So that's about it. That's all I've got. And it was kind of just a conglomeration of thoughts. I hope that's okay. And I'm going to open up the last, uh, I think there's eight or 12 or some odd minutes for questions and answers if you guys have any. Okay. Oh, thanks, Dave. You talked about how um, you got some biased answers from your translator, and I was just wondering, like, based on your given topic and the focus on women, if you think you would have gotten different answers if you had a female translator or if you were considered. Um, I, I do. I think I would have gotten <clears throat> not just. It's really it's really interesting how much difference the difference that a, a translator can make, and for me to have a, a female translator in India at the time probably was not the most appropriate thing. Uh, just culturally, it wouldn't have been quite as acceptable as the people that I did work with had a standing relationship with these people. So they had gone out and taught courses. They knew these women, and it was okay for these women to be talking with men. For me to find a female translator just in and of itself would have been fairly difficult, I think, in India. But I think it would have changed. I think it, it really would have changed my answers. And, and that's one thing, you know... Um, by the time, so in India, you're given a slightly shorter time frame to do your research uh, if you're doing it in the village. And I found that about halfway through to maybe two thirds of the way through my time, all my interviews had been done with men. So the untouchable part of my interview was great, or of my research was was great, and I felt like it was coming along really well. But the women part of my research was not coming along very well, and I had to work really hard to get interviews with women, uh, and especially ones that would actually you know, talk to me really honestly. Most of the women uh, initially had, I, I, you could tell that they, because I was interviewing with this man who worked with this institution, they would kind of give, they always, well, everyone at the first gave the same answers, the same repetitive, like memorized answers. But then it would take a while asking more questions and they'd finally loosen up and say, you know what, I don't really agree with what I said like a half hour ago. Like That's just what I was told to say. So I think it would have changed changed my, my results quite a bit. But I think, in the same token, I think that I think that overall my feeling was that things were still headed in, headed in a good direction. That women still felt like they were being incorporated into this political uh, I don't know what you'd call it clockwork or this political uh, the framework that they were able to get things done. The women actually were doing things. They had responsibility. They had the means to get things done, get things accomplished. So it, it was good, I think, in the end. I was just going to say, translating is, is always an issue because you, it's not just gender, it's everything else. But I mean, and there's, there's, in India, you've got this whole, 
added component of cast, which kind of works into, at times is not a problem, but when I interviewed with the first uh, gentleman that I mentioned, he is not, he's a Christian, but regardless, there's still a caste association with where he is. And when we went out to interview at the Panchayat meeting that first time, uh, it was it was very prevalent. I mean, it was very clear that they knew where he was, and he knew his position in the social stature of those who were there interviewing. And, and that kind of changed things a little bit. So, yeah, there's a lot of complicating factors, but I still think you can do good research even, you know, regardless. Um, concerning research methods, uh-huh. um, I've, I mean, I'm a senior. I'm actually a second-year senior. I'm working on the third year soon, but I've been doing research for a while. Um, but I, I think you can always get better. Um, I'm also in the humanities, and so social science research um, mm-hmm. seems to have some differences. I realize you can't anticipate everything, but especially from your experience coming home, um, can compared to as you were doing research before, what uh, what did you learn about um, maybe different ways that you could have thought about a topic or, um, or different planning as you go into your research to where you could have had a little bit better anticipation of, um, of topics that may have come up? I understand you can't get everything. Yeah. Well, I think, I think largely, <clears throat> you know, if I had had, see, in, in India's, you know, like many places, is a difficult place to do social science research because of this language barrier. If I had had um, access to someone who spoke Tamil here in you know, when I was in Provo, when I was still preparing my research, I think I would have done. Excuse me, I would have at least attempted to find some kind of standardized surveys that I could put out, or something that I could, j- just a very standard questionnaire that I could present to people that. Um, that I could somehow later go through and, and kind of uh, lay down the, the data where it fell. Also, the only other thing I think of just off the top of my head is when I got home, <clears throat> there was no one for me to interview. <clears throat> when I got home, all I could do was find books, find articles, maybe by some stroke of luck happen to meet someone in a chat room who was from India or something. Uh, I don't know. But, uh, um, there were a lot of questions that I had unanswered when I left India because of just a lack of, of information beforehand. So I really think, this sounds crazy and I don't know how to do it, but if you could just gather all the information about your topic before you go, that would help you a lot. Uh, I, know, I know that sounds really unrealistic, but if I, I mean, even if I'd spent 10, 15, 20 more hours just researching stuff before I left, I feel like it would have helped me a lot. Because I think, I think uh, research preparation is kind of, and its usefulness is kind of an exponential scale. Like as you start doing research in the library, you start reading things, you know, it, it, it helps you marginally. But then after a certain breaking point where, and this is the exact same thing in the field. I spent, you know, eight weeks or seven weeks, you know, kind of on this marginal scale. And then the, the last two or three weeks, my research just took off. I mean, absolutely took off. I started getting interviews every day, twice a day, three times a day. I mean, it was, but you have to put in a certain amount of effort. And I think it's the same with doing book research in the library and on, on the Internet. It was, it was a certain point where you just kind of marginally get more information and feel more comfortable with your topic. And then there's a point where you start taking off dramatically. And I think it's important not only to get to that point, but to keep continuing on after you get to that point. So that's, I know that's very vague, but I hope that helps. Okay. All right, touching back on you, uh, when you were addressing your translator, and you uh-huh. mentioned that one of your best interviews was with a new translator, uh-huh. do you feel like there are additional pros to maybe switching or using various translators, and if that's a possibility? Um, I think um, you run into, okay, yes, there are pros, but you run into additional complications when you change translators, because when you stick with one translator, you get to understand their nuances. You get to understand, you, you come to know, you know how they ask questions. Not just the questions that they ask, but like if they're addressing them politely, if they're addressing them like they're retarded, or do you know what I mean? Like you, you get to know the, the translator and the way they translate fairly well. Um, for me at that point, when I started doing translations and they provided this person to me, I didn't feel like I was in a position where I could ask for a different translator from that institution. I felt like I just needed to do what I could with what I had. And he did a great job most of the time. But again, I think there are pros in changing translators in that you're going to get a different experience with each translator. 
But then again, it's hard to account for different, like I said, nuances. If you've got a translator who, um, I'm trying to think of an, an example. With the translator that did most of my translating, it wasn't until about four or five interviews into it that I realized when he said something, and it was something that he said quite often because it was a question that I, I asked quite often, that what he was saying was not exactly what he meant. Like his, his English was good, but it wasn't great. So he'd say one thing and, and mean something different. And it wasn't until we'd, we'd done these five or six interviews and went out to lunch one day and we were talking and, and I asked him about it. And he's like, oh, this is what I, you know, this is, this is what they said. I'm like, well, is this what you mean? And he'd say, no, 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 that's not what I meant. This is what I meant. And then it took an hour or two hours to discuss what he actually meant. Because that's not something you can usually do in the process of an interview. Because you're there to discuss it, you know, ask questions to the third person. So I think, I think it's very beneficial to have one really good translator uh, that, you can, that you can get to know and work with all the time. But I don't think it will set you back too far if you are changing. And I think that if you have a translator who is, in fact, kind of uh, skewing the answers, that it, it would be very beneficial at that point to, to change translators. Isn't the trouble also with translators is these are real people and you develop relationships with them. So just like... For example, I don't know if you caught the significance of what Jake was saying, but him, if he was having a female translator, Shana, then he, he will discredit himself in the eyes of everybody he comes across because he's traipsing around with a female translator. And it's inappropriate for men and women to be in that kind of relationship over a long period of time. So he's got to be careful. With translators you start working with, they may be a lousy translator, but the problem is now they're your friend, and you can't say, you know what, I'm uh, going with someone else. I'm going with somebody else, you know. <laughs> uh, and and also they rely on on the pay that we give them, on on the compensation we give. Yeah. So uh, I think the best advice is is be cautious when you're entering into the selection process of translators. Spend quite a bit of time, even without talking to them about working for mm -hmm. you sizing them up, listening to them, checking out their English, uh, trying to figure out their position in the community and, and whether or not they're taken serious or they're legitimate people in the community because it makes a really, really a big difference. Well, and I think, I think the field studies program provides you a tremendous asset by having students that have been before who work with you, the students who have been to the field who work with you because they can provide recommendations and they also know generally speaking, they'll know which people have been used as translators before and kind of the pros and cons of each individual translator. So I think you know, it's not like you're just out there like, can anyone here speak English? You know, can you help me? It's, it's you've got resources here at, at, through the Kennedy Center, which is really nice. Uh, in those instances where you felt that the answers were being skewed, when it came to the point of your synthesizing like their nonverbal messages with what verbally mm -hmm. you understood the answer to be, how did you go about that in your uh, conclusions of your research? Like, how did you synthesize those two things? Okay, I think um, in my in my research, you know, this is uh, for anyone who's done research before. Your first time doing real research is going to be hopefully not your best ever research done. Um, and and I, I was very clear in my research conclusions that, you know, I had, I had these complications with my interviewers and my interviewees. And again, doing cross-cultural studies, it becomes difficult in that body language and nonverbal cues are very different. And so it, it takes, you know, a few weeks to really get to where you're you know, this is okay, you know. It's, this is not like I'm deciding on what I want to do. This is like, like yes or, you know. It's an affirmative uh, body signal. So as far as synthesizing, you know, what I heard with what I saw, it wasn't until really I'd been out there for a while. I mean, even though I'd had this previous five, five and a half months in India, it wasn't until I'd been out for a few weeks interviewing that I could really, that I really felt comfortable saying, this is what they said, but this is what I think they, I mean, from what they were doing, this is what I think they may have said, uh, which is slightly different than what they said. But the thing is, you can't draw conclusions on what you think they said. You can only draw conclusions on what, what you heard. 
So it was it was it was difficult to synthesize the two. But towards the end, when I when I could clearly identify that what the the translator was saying was not what I heard or saw, I would repeat the question in a different way to make sure that I got the right answer. And that was and translators are they're really good about that. If you ask the same question but just in a different way, they they usually because the translating mode I think we all know how it is. You just you hear and you respond. Usually you hear and you respond. So you don't really think about what you're asking. So if you ask a question a second time in a slightly different way, they they won't be offended by that. You know. So that that's what I did towards the end when I realized that. And I, again, this didn't happen all too often. Just when I could clearly identify that what she said was not what he said, then I'd I'd ask again. So yeah. All right. <laughs>